This morning, we are starting a series. Um, if you notice, I've got a RC Celebrate Recovery shirt. You've probably seen some other folks with those shirts on. Um, we are in the process of launching a brand new ministry here at the church. It's called Celebrate Recovery. Um, how, many, how many of you know what Celebrate Recovery is? And I've heard of it before, okay? Um, Celebrate Recovery is, is a ministry um, that is designed to help people um, that have life-controlling issues, and many times we think of that as being drugs or alcohol or pornography, and yes, those fall into that category, but they're also there, it's designed to just help people get through struggles in their life, because one of their key phrases is that everybody's got hurts, habits, and hang-ups, okay? And uh, we are in the process. Matter of fact, if you are on that steering committee and have been meeting with Pastor Richard, would you stand, please? for me this morning, if you are a part of that, okay? Um, these folks that morning after the service are going to be out at their, t they've got a table out there, and if you have questions, thanks guys, you can sit down. If you have questions, because there's going to be an informational meeting coming up, all different kinds of things, if you have questions and would like to be involved, this is an awesome ministry, okay? It is awesome. The, the lives are being changed as a result. I personally know of a person, um, a very, very good friend of mine that, that, struggled with some stuff for a long time and they finally got um, into Celebrate Recovery and they've been completely set free. In fact, now this individual is actually teaching as a part of the team over at Kensington Church um, and doing their step studies and things of that nature. So if you've got questions about Celebrate Recovery, these folks will be back there. They will be glad to give you all the information that you need. So for the next few weeks, though, Pastor Richard was going to do this one. Um, I was all set to preach on hang-ups um, on Labor Day weekend, but the issue came up with, with, with Jane and her family, and so he came to me, he says, hey, he says, he says, can you preach about hurts this week? And I figure hurts and hang-ups are pretty close. Sure, I can do hurts, not a problem. You know, I, 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 I can do that. So this morning, we're going to talk a little bit about, um, we're going to talk about hurts as a part of that three, three-prong emphasis with Celebrate Recovery. And the title of my message this morning is, I Got a Rock. I Got a Rock. How many of you have got a rock? I didn't say rocks in your head. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, how many of you got a rock? I want you to go in your Bibles this morning to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. And we find the Apostle Paul writing, and he says from the New International Version, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Now, verse 5, he goes on to describe what these strongholds are. We, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ, okay? I notice, we, we, as, as, as Pentecostal believers especially, we're all about spiritual warfare, and I'm so glad that we are. I'm thankful for our intercessory prayer team and all the things. But many times we want to we we put the blame on Satan for stuff that really isn't, a, isn't an obstacle that he's placed somewhere. It's actually an obstacle that rests between the space between our two ears. Okay, And many times those things cause us to get in a place where we, we get stuck and we can't, we can't move on and we, we can't get through life and it causes us to go into all different kinds of things. And so that what Paul is talking about, he said that, that our power through the Lord that our weaponry that we have is about demolishing the strongholds between here, not necessarily about demolishing the strongholds that are out here. Because can I tell you this morning, if you get these taken care of, these aren't such a big deal. <clears throat> it's interesting that in the message translation, um, that, that fifth verse says this, we use our powerful God tools for smashing warped philosophies tearing down barriers erected against the truth of God, fitting every loose thought and emotion and impulse into the structure of life shaped by Christ. Okay, you see, and that's what a hurt is. A hurt is one of those things that, that, that usually that, that'll latch on to us in a way that, that has the ability to totally um, dis, not only disrupt our lives, but control our lives if we allow it to, okay? This morning, I'm going to go quickly, okay? I, I don't have a lot of time, but I, wanna, I want you to catch some stuff for me here this morning. Number one, this morning in talking about the subject of hurts, our hurts, if we're not careful, become the lens and the filter through which we view and process everything in our lives. Our hurts will become the lens 
and the, the, the filter through which we process everything in our lives. If you've ever been wounded, if you've ever been hurt, um, whether it was as a child growing up, it is amazing how that hurt or that wound that you received, um, and it's not necessarily physical, it's the emotional and the spiritual wounds, have a way of latching onto you to the point that you will go around, spend your whole life processing everything through that hurt and that wound, okay? That's why, that's why p- people who get, who get wounded in churches... They will go to a new church, and the first thing that they do, they process everything that goes on in that church through that wound that they received in a previous experience. That's why people who, who are raised and children in homes that, 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 that are abused and things of that nature, that's why abused children will tend to, unless God intervenes, will tend toward becoming abusers in their adult life because they, they, they've latched onto something that's latched onto them. That hurt becomes a lens or a filter. You know, and it's all about perspective. My wife and I were on vacation this um, past week, a couple of weeks ago actually, and we were up north and she was out sitting on, on the balcony of our, of our room that we had and, and beautiful view overlooking a lake and the woods and just all kinds of awesome things. And, and she was out there and she comes running in and she grabs her, her notebook and, and she starts writing. I'm going, what are, you, what are you writing down? And she has this, this, this photo out there where she was sitting. There's the chair rail and in between two of the little rails of the, of the handrail was this spider. Okay, there was a spider there. And, and while she was watching this spider, it was amazing that as she focused on the spider, she was unable to see the beauty in the distance because of her focus on that spider. Now, I can understand that because I hate spiders. Okay? I am convinced. If, there, if you want proof that there is a devil, all you got to do is see a spider. I'm convinced of it. I hate spiders. Spiders, you know, if they, they can be all they want outside, don't you dare come to my house, okay? Because I'll tell you what, I can, it doesn't matter where I'm at. If I see a spider, you can ask my wife. I am unable to focus on anything until I get up and get that spider, and it's going to be dead, okay? The spider's going to die. It's just go, go see Jesus, you know, whatever spider. You're, you're, you know, poor little spider, nobody likes you, you know, um, type of deal. And, and I even downstairs in my basement, when I go down to work out in the mornings and, and I'll get on my exercise bike or whatever, um, you know how basements are. Basements have a way of attracting things that don't go anywhere else in your house. And there'll be a spider like up in the corner all the way across the room. I'm talking across the basement and I see this spider and I know that spider is watching me. I'm telling you. And he's just waiting for me to divert my attention away from him because he's going to come and get me. I, I cannot exercise. I will stop that bike, get up, go over, get a Kleenex, get a chair, get up on it, and crush that spider. And I make sure, I, mean, I don't just kill it, I squish it good. I hate spiders. But it's like the, the, that spider to me is like hurts in our lives. We get so focused on the hurt, our perspective gets totally skewed, and we can't see the beauty and the awesomeness of something that may be beyond because we're so focused on that spider. We're so focused on that hurt, on that wound in our lives. And, and, and it does the same thing. And in order for, for her to be able to get beyond that spider, you have to change your position to change your perspective. You see, and, and, and we have to understand that, that, that in our lives, when we're, when we're, when we're bound up by hurts and, and, and wounds in our lives, they have a tendency to grab our attention and arrest our attention. And until we change our position, our perspective will never change. Number two, people who have been hurt either tend to shy away from others and isolate themselves or they find relationships that tend to enable them and feed the justification for how they feel. You know, we're, we're, we're getting ready in a few weeks to launch our life groups. In fact, this past Wednesday night, we had a training session. Going to do the same training this Wednesday night. If you are interested in life groups and wanting to host or lead a life group, I encourage you to be here 7 o'clock this Wednesday night. We're going to talk about our life groups because life groups are important. Okay, that that connection is important. You know, we we come into church, isn't it amazing? We come into church and we can be holy and we can be spiritual and we can shout and we can do all kinds of good things. But when you get among in, 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 in in a group of close friends where you can't hide in a crowd, all of a sudden you have to begin to get real. See, that's what we like about our life groups. But it's interesting that that people that have been wounded and hurt, sometimes they will totally shy away from. That's why life groups are so important, guys. You need to be plugged into to it with a group of people that will hold you accountable, that you can hold accountable, that it's okay to get real with. 
See, my wife and I, we host a life group in our, in our home, and um, very rarely, because some of those folks are, are in the service this morning, and they, they, can, they can vouch for this, very rarely do we do any kind of a Bible study or, or anything like that. Most of the time what we talk about is how's life going, what's going on, what can we pray with you. It's a time for us to get real and, and for everybody to understand, hey, we've all got wounds, we've all got hurts, we've all got issues. I, I, carry, I carry enough issues for me, myself, and, and, and I, three plus all of you together, um, if you know what I mean this morning. And so we, we tend to, they'll tend to shy away from that, or they will find groups of people that feed into their woundedness and their hurtness and their viewpoint that they have. See, the Bible puts it this way. It says one thing. It says, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. That's in a good sense, but in another sense, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 says this, um, don't be deceived, bad character, our bad company will corrupt your character. Okay, we, we, we have to understand that that will do that, and we can't allow the hurts in our lives to control us to the point that we stay away from people because we're afraid we're going to get hurt. And isn't it interesting that the things that wounded us the most are the things that we're able to pick out in other people? That one went over like a lead balloon, but that's all right. You see, thirdly this morning, Satan is always trying to get us to turn our hurts. I like to call them rocks. Satan is always trying to get us to turn our hurts or our rocks into the things that we feed on. This morning I got a little video clip um, I want to show you, okay? Um, and, and before you watch this clip, I'm going to tell you now, I do not want one email this week about this video clip, okay? See, see the content of it, and if you've got, you got an issue, Pastor Richard at rccchurchlife.com, okay? Show it. Can I have an extra piece of candy for my stupid brother? He couldn't come with us because he's sitting in a pumpkin patch waiting for the great pumpkin. It's so embarrassing to have to ask for something extra for that blockhead Linus. I got five pieces of candy. I got a chocolate bar. I got a quarter. I got a rock. Gee, I got a candy bar. Boy, I got three cookies. Hey, I got a package of gum. I got a rock. Trick or treat. I got a popcorn ball. I got a fetch ball. I got a pack of gum. I got a rock. You know, we laugh at that, and, and, and the reality is a lot of us are Charlie Brown. A lot of us are Charlie Brown. And, and, and matter of fact, Jesus, in, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4, we find this incident in the life of Christ right after he had been baptized. It says in chapter, or verse 1 of chapter 4, it says, And Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came to him and said, If you're the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. You see... What the enemy will try to do to you, to the wounds or the rocks in your life, he will want you to turn them into your daily bread to where all you do is feed on those things, to where you constantly are, are enamored with that or you're constantly going on with that. How many, how many got cut off in traffic this week? Okay. How many of you had somebody pull out in front of you and instead of going the speed limit, they went 10 miles under the speed limit when you were in a hurry to get where you were going? Okay. How many of you got behind somebody who wasn't paying attention at the red light, and when it turned green, they sat there because they were too busy texting or doing whatever, and, and you got upset and angry about it? Why did you get upset and angry? Have you ever asked yourself that? Why does that make such a big deal? I'm standing here, and it's like, because my time's more important than their time. They're keeping me from getting where I'm going. And it's amazing the things in our lives this morning that, that, that will turn into those things. And, and have you ever asked yourself, why do, I, why do I respond the way I respond? Why did that make me so angry? 
Why am I messing with that? I'll tell you why. It's because you've got some rocks in your life, and the reality is, is that you've been eating on the rocks because you've turned them into bread. And they've taken control of our lives, and that's not what God has planned for us. You see, it wouldn't have mattered what Charlie Brown got in his bag. I'm, I'm serious. I don't know about you, but growing up as a kid, I never saw my mom keep a box of rocks by the front door just for the kids that came with too many holes in their sheet. Some of you will get that in a minute. Okay, my, my mom, I, I really don't think these people in the video kept a box of rocks around just because they knew Charlie Brown was coming so they could give him a rock when they gave everybody else candy. You see, the reality is, is that it wouldn't have mattered what Charlie Brown got. He could have got the greatest Snickers bar in the world. It was funny, my parents always went through my candy when I'd come in from trick-or-treating, and my dad, it never failed, all the Snickers bars were bad. <laughs> oh, you know, those are bad, you can't know, you can't... But you see, it wouldn't have mattered what Charlie Brown got until he changed his perspective in his mind. He was always going to see a rock. You see, the Lord has given us weapons of warfare that are mighty through God to the pulling down of every one of those arguments and those things in our lives that have caused us to be wounded, that cause us to be angry, that cause us to lose our temper all the time, that cause us to all the different life controlling, whether it, whether it be in, in, in the area of pornography or all, any, anything. You know, we, we think of life controlling issues and we think, oh man, that's, that's, that's the big three. It's, 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 it's sex and it's, it's drug addiction and alcohol addiction. What about, what about all you people that practice um, when you get in a bad mood or you've had a bad day, you practice uh, retail therapy. I'm just saying. And before you get, before those of you that didn't say anything get too judgmental, how about all you guys that, that practice tool retail therapy? Or you practice vehicle retail therapy? Or you practice food retail therapy? You see, we've all got hurts and we've all got wounds. The issue isn't whether you have hurts and wounds or not. The issue is, what are you doing to allow Jesus to destroy those things and bring that mindset under the control of Jesus Christ? That's what it's all about. Because here's the deal this morning, folks. God cannot change the event that brought the hurt into your life. We waste so much time in our lives trying to get even with somebody or something that happened years in the past and we keep running it over in our minds and playing it through and thinking if I can only, if I could have only, man, I wish I would have done this or I wish, you know what, God, you can't change what happened in the past and God can't change what happened in the past. But what God can do is that by his love and power, he can help you write a new ending to the story this morning. That story, that event, that rock, that wound, that hurt does not have to control you. Does not have to be the thing that, that drives you in everything that you do. As a pastor, I do a lot of marital counseling. Sometimes I wish I didn't. But it's amazing when you begin to talk to people, especially people that, that have been married before. And then they come, they're married again, and they come to you for counseling. And it's amazing how that at so many times they're going through, there's these issues and everything, and I'll ask a question, and was this an issue in your previous marriage? Yeah. And when I dig a little deeper, because we tend to want to blame that person that we were there, well, it was all their fault, and, and granted, it may, they, may, they may have been jerks. Okay. But the reality is, if you dig deep enough, what you'll find out is that usually that's a wound, a hurt, or a rock that they have been carrying for a lot of years. And the issue is never going to get settled because they're constantly trying to deal with that rock. That rock is not going away. That's there. It happened. It was, it was terrible. It, there's nothing you can do about it. 
But here's the deal. What you do have the ability is that you as an individual, because of that rock, because of that stone, because of that hurt or that wound, you've attached a story to that that you process everything going through. Somebody that's been hurt by a pastor, I guarantee you every church they go to, they're going to go with a skeptical eye thinking, well, that, that, that pastor, I'm going to keep my eye on them. Or that I've talked to people where they've talked about how that they were in a church where, where, where leadership was very manipulative and controlling. And so they go into every experience thinking the same thing, and that's what they're constantly looking for. And I learned a long time ago, if you look long enough and hard enough, you'll find what you're looking for. But you see, we've attached stories to those things, and the reality is about the hurts in our lives. This is what's so great about Celebrate Recovery, is that it forces you to begin to look at some things from a very realistic point of view. Something that happened way long ago, and we let it control us. And the reality is, is this is that you can't change the event, but you can change the way the story ends. You do not have to allow that thing to have control over you. You don't have to respond in the way that you've always responded. You can change it. You know why? Because God says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through him to the pulling down of those strongholds. Arguments, all those things, impulses, emotions, all those things that we've attached to those stories. And this morning, um, um, we, we have George Davis... Um, is one of the, the individuals that's, that's helping us spearhead the Celebrate Recovery uh, group and, and ministry. And he's going to come and share his testimony with you. Is that okay? Would you all like to hear a testimony? George, why don't you give it up for George this morning, would you please? Good. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello, my name is George. I'm a grateful follower of Jesus Christ who has struggled with alcoholism, control issues, along with other hurts, hang-ups, and habits. This is a very condensed version of my testimony. My recovery story begins with a godly mother who read me the Bible at home <clears throat> taught me biblical principles, and brought me to many church functions. Behind the scenes and from my earliest memory, I learned to hide all the dysfunctions from a life riddled with a severely mentally unstable father who lashed out at us from issues with anger, sexual perversion, and control. I am the second youngest of eight children from an extremely dysfunctional family. My father would leave for weeks, sometimes years, and we moved approximately 15 times in my first 13 years, not counting the times before my birth. Being saved at a young age, I was always thinking I had to go back and restart my relationship with God. I never seemed to grasp hold of walking out of life in a relationship with a loving father. Addiction comes in many forms. Taking something lightly, such as alcohol, in today's society seems to be the norm. My first drink was at age 13, and I immediately could feel a sense of power, courage, and a false sense of control. There was a lot of toxic shame and guilt that would drive me to later try drugs, but I always came back to alcohol. This was my sweet spot. This is where I could function, and so I tried. The road to where I am today was paved with drinking small amounts to binge drinking, along with a life of hiding alcohol in any way, shape, or form, so I would never be found out, or so I thought. I could quit for days, weeks, or months, white knuckling. But the binge drinking and consumption would always return because I could never get rid of the root shame and guilt. By the age of 30 years old, I was a functioning alcoholic who could quote scripture to back up any argument and to support my way of thinking and where I was in life. I refer to 2 Corinthians 10.5, which we just read. Remember, pride comes before the fall. 
I believed that I loved my Lord and Savior, and I knew what Jesus had done for me. He had given me a home, my children, my career, but I would lose all of this several times over in the next 20 years. My lifestyle was taking its toll, and it started to spiral downward. My years of living this way and hiding alcohol, even to the point of excusing myself from church service in order to have a drink, would soon bring about my hitting bottom, as we call it. I was consuming alcohol to deal with life, consuming it on a daily, hourly basis at different points. Nothing was exempt, church or family functions, and on and on. I always needed a false sense of hope for a few hours. Yes, I was messed up from the ground up, but isn't that what addiction does? Romans 6.21 says this, What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. God loves saving people from addiction because God knows your addiction is your God. My introduction to Celebrate Recovery came as I attempted to regain my past and fix what had gone wrong. Colossians 2, 13 through 14 says, And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Celebrate Recovery was introduced to me in 2006. I was asked by my pastor at my church to begin one, and so I did. I had been through rehabs before. They worked for a short time, but would not last. When I began these steps and principles, the greatest re occurring question in my mind was why are we not using this in our churches and Sunday schools? I wanted to regain my life, but what I was about to find out was that God was planning my future. It would be a few years of walking out these steps. This is where I realized that all the condemning scripture I had heard in my past was now like a healing balm. I was in a spiritual triage, and I did not even know it. I began finding God's word convicting me, but did not crush me. The shame and the guilt began slowly and steadily lifting. I no longer just read God's word, but it was like I saw it for the first time. There was no more condemnation but love, peace, and life. I began to cry out, as in Romans 8:14 through 16, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive. You did not receive the spirit of bondage. <sighs> but you received a spirit of adoption. by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. As I began to use the repetition of Celebrate Recovery's 12 steps and eight principles, my chains fell off. I began to understand true praise, true worship to the Father and what salvation meant and what the scripture calls the new birth, knowing that I was far from perfect. I had many character defects, which would not change overnight, but required time and a renewing of my mind. I'm reminded of an old hymn, How Firm a Foundation. The one and only time God sobered me in the middle of the night when I cried out to him. I got up and I wrote out this verse. In the middle of the night, I folded it up, I emptied out a bottle, I cleaned it, I dried it out, and I put it in there, and it stayed there for years. This was the verse that God gave me 
The soul that on Jesus that hath leaned for repose, I will not, I will not desert to his foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no never, never forsake. And with that, I say thank you very, very much for letting me share my testimony with you. There's somebody that finally decided to quit letting rocks be his bread. I want everybody to bow their heads in this place this morning. Before the service, I was praying in here, and, and I just felt, and I shared it with the ushers and greeters that we meet with before the service. I just, I told them, I said, I really feel in my spirit that God um, is going to, do some really cool stuff this morning and setting some people free. Because this room and this church is no different than any other room or church all over this nation, all over the world. It's filled with people that have lived with wounds and hurts and those things have governed their lives for years. And you may not have responded in the same way that George did going to alcohol but no you've responded in other ways and it's been in control of you and it's those those wounds have become rocks that have, the enemy has made you eat those things every day and the Lord wants to set you free from those things he wants to set you free from those things and if you're here this morning with heads bowed and eyes closed and, and you would be honest enough with yourself. You, you don't understand how much guts it takes to get up in front of a, a group of people like this and to share, to share your, 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 your failures and your foibles. But I'm sure George isn't the only one that's had a few failures in their life. And you're here this morning and you've been living a life that, that, that has been controlled by, by wounds and hurts. Maybe it was from childhood. Maybe it was in the way you were raised. Maybe you had an absentee parent. Maybe it, was, it could be all kinds of things. Maybe it was in, 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 a, in a previous relationship or, or a previous marriage or maybe in your marriage now or, or whatever the case may be. There's wounds there that you have carried for years. Maybe it's from a church that you were there and you committed yourself to and, and you were faithful to it and, and you got wounded, you got hurt, something happened. Maybe you were in a church that that, that leadership failed morally and, and that forever somebody you trusted and put your and put your faith in literally just just crushed that in an instant whatever those wounds are this morning there is a god in heaven who says all of those things that have exalted themselves against the knowledge of him in your life can be demolished and destroyed this morning. so if you're here today you're in this place and you'll be honest enough with yourself to say, you know what? I'm tired of eating rocks. I'm tired of eating rocks in my life. And, 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 and I want those th things to be destroyed. I want them to be demolished. I want them to be crushed this morning because I'm tired of allowing them to control me and control my behavior and everything else about me. I'm done with it. If you're here this morning and that's you, I'm not asking you to raise a hand. I want you to shoot both hands straight up in the air. If that's you this morning, raise both hands up in the air. If that's you, raise both hands. Come on. There's hands going up all over the place. Come on. Be honest enough with yourself. Be honest enough with, with, with inside of you because it really doesn't matter what anybody thinks. We've all, got, we've all got rocks. We've all got wounds. We've all got hurts. The question isn't, do you have hurts? The question is, how have you handled them? How have you dealt with them? I want everybody in this place to join me in prayer this morning, okay? Keep those hands up. Keep them up. Keep them up. Keep them up. Father, right now, in Jesus' name, Lord, I thank you for the testimony. I thank you, first of all, for the courage of a man to stand in front of his peers and to openly share, Father, 
things in his life that, that, Lord, he's probably not too proud of. But, Father, you've given him victory. You have set him free from those things, Father. You have taken those things that, 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 that garbled his mind and controlled his life, Father, and you destroyed them and demolished them. And, Father, this morning you see these hands that are lifted. And, God, I know there's probably many, many more that, that have issues. But, but, God, that's okay. They've, they've got to come to that, that, that realization on their own. And Father, right now, I just pray for these that have their hands raised. And I pray, God, in Jesus' name, that according to your word, Father, the weapons, Lord, of the Spirit would go to work on them right now. Father, every thought every 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 impulse every emotion every habit father that they've used to try to to try to control and, and, and all the different things father these wounds in their lives I pray right now father you would dip your pen in the blood of your son and write a new ending to the story this morning write a new ending to the story this morning God Father, they're not in bondage. They're free. Father, they're not in control of somebody else. They're free. Father, I pray that you would just let that be there right there. God, and I pray that you would give them a spirit, Father, of canceling that debt. They're never going to be able, Lord, to change that event. They're never going to be able to exact retribution. But, Father, they can cancel a debt, and you can rewrite the story this morning. Father, I pray for that in Jesus' name. God, I just bless this body of believers today. And Father, I thank you, Lord, for the direction, Lord, in this ministry of Celebrate Recovery. Father, I pray that, God, it would be, Lord, it would be literally a godsend for so many people. That, Father, people will begin to come, Lord God, from, from, from Lord, all different walks of life. Not only those that are sitting in the pew, but those, Lord, that find it, that they, they find out, hey, there's somebody there that cares, that, that, they can, that can pray with me and help me and, and walk me through these issues. Father, and I just pray for that anointing. I pray that, Lord, captives will be set free in the name of Jesus. Father, you're awesome. You're mighty. And I thank you for it today. In Jesus' awesome name. In Jesus' name, hallelujah, hallelujah.